So good afternoon. I'm Jesse Perkins, Executive Director of the Bethel Area Chamber of Commerce. For those of you who we have met in uh, COVID times, uh, thank you for Zooming with us today. We've had a great turnout with about 40 people registered to talk about the future of sustainable tourism in the Mahusik region. I don't have to tell you what a coaster ride this year has been with a lot of change for the Chamber and all of you, but one of the things I'm most proud of is the work that the Mahusik Sustainable Tourism Committee has done throughout all these topsy-turvy times. Uh, this is, so that committee is the one that formed after we went through the Community Destination Academy process about a year ago. Many of you participated in that, but I also wanted to extend a special welcome to anyone who's just jumping into this conversation for the first time, and I'm happy to get you caught up offline if you uh, want to make that time. There has been a lot of good work going on behind the scenes, and we are excited to bring you into the loop and start unveiling some really cool stuff. Very tight agenda today, uh, so I'll move things along and let you know that we'll be hearing from Mike Wilson from the Northern Forest Center about the evolution of the process, an update on emerging trends from David Burrell of Future IQ, who continues to be our facilitator, uh, some important case studies from Amy Halstead, Mia Purcell, and Barbara Barrett, and then we'll wrap up presentations by 1230 and move into 15 minutes of Q&A that you're welcome to stay for. The agenda is posted in the chat. And just a reminder that this session is being recorded. So smile pretty. And uh, next I will hand things over to Mike Wilson. Great, Th thanks Jesse and hello everyone. Again, just for those who don't know, I'm Mike Wilson, I'm the Senior Program Director with the Northern Forest Center. We're a regional nonprofit working on forest-based economic and community development programs all across Northern Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont and New York. Um, We've gotten into this work in partnership with the main office of tourism. I'll ask Donna Moreland from the office of tourism to at least wave your hand over there so everyone recognizes you. Um, so the center um, has been working in partnership with the main office of tourism for a couple of years now through uh, another entity called the Maine Woods Consortium um, to, to, to work on how do we build the capacity and support uh, projects and infrastructure development and experience development in what we consider high potential rural destination areas. Um, the Bethel Mahusik area is clearly one of those places with a really great uh, concentration of assets, businesses, services, experiences for people. Um, so we engaged with the chamber and some other partners in town to launch the Community Destination Academy program just about a year ago. Um, and had great participation by many of you here on the call um, over, I think it was four days of, of, of training, information, and workshops and planning uh, facilitated by David Burrell. Um, since then, it's been a great leadership team that has come together through that. We originally called it the, the CDA leadership team. Uh, it has evolved to consider itself and call itself the Mahusik Sustainable Tourism Committee, given the, the focus of the discussions through the CDA on this idea of sustainable tourism and how do we not love a place to death. Um, just as a, a few checkpoints as we've gone along, the group formed itself as the Mahusik Sustainable Tourism Committee, um, has really identified this idea of sustainable tourism and working on a sustainable tourism pledge to help align uh, uh, activities and engagement both by local people and visitors and businesses in the area around the idea of sustainability and we'll get more into that but also just to recognize that that leadership team I'm not going to list everyone but is made up of a really nice mix of uh, the town managers so the municipalities some key business leaders and nonprofit organizations so there's a nice mix of perspectives there um, and as we've been moving forward with the work, a few other milestones, people may not have, this hasn't been uh, really launched yet, but following on all this work, Mahusik Pathways uh, secured a, a grant through the Northern Forest Center uh, to start development and design work on a recreational wayfinding system in the area that links right back to the conversations we had during the CDA program. Um, the, um, Most Sustainable Tourism Committee through the Chamber secured a grant from the Main Office of Tourism uh, to continue and, and build on this work around the pledge that we'll talk about a little bit more. And, and there is, just to be clear, there's funding that uh, the Center and MOT are providing through the CDA program also to support work by the Sustainable Tourism Committee. So 
kind of from the original nugget of, uh, of let's do a, a destination academy program. It's been really exciting to see the community lean into that and the leadership come out of the community to, to really work on securing resources and developing projects to move this work forward. And with that, Jesse, I will hand it back to you as our MC. Okay, looks like next on the agenda is David. Thank you very much, Thank Mike. You. So David, we'll move into recapping and emerging trends. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Hello, everybody. Good to see all familiar faces and some new ones as well. So um, I'm just going to do a kind of a recap, right, because it's been a good while since we were involved in the CDA. So I just want to, I'm going to revisit some of the work that came out of that, because that, I think, sets us up to understand the next steps that we want to talk about um, today and in the uh, Zooms in the future. I'm just going to share a few slides, right, to get kind of some visual recognition again. All right. So. Um, to recap, right? So if you remember, if you're involved in the CDA, this is just a refresher, right? So we had the, the two modules um, at the end of 2019, then we had the community summit in 2020. Um, we had about hundred people there um, at that. And then obviously, as Jesse and Mike have said, the work's been continuing since then, but it really has been outside of the sort of the realm of the public sort of facing CDA. Um, but to sort of recap some of the, some of the underlying principles. So the, the whole, the big issue here, right? This is the big kind of challenge, right? Is in a recreation destination tourism economy like yours, and you're no different to all the others, right? The, the issue is about how do you sustain balance, right? Because there's these industry value, you get jobs and you know economic growth and so on, um, but there are potential community impacts. So the CDA really wrestled with where does this balance lie for this region, right? And this is the sort of, <clears throat> I think this is an ongoing discussion, right? There's no simple answer to this, but other than trying to figure out how do you sustain that balance so that people's quality of life is sustained, but you also extract some of the, the value from the industry. Um, when we asked in the CDA people about, um, against sort of these dimensions of sustainable tourism on the scale of one, we're doing very, poorly to 10 we're doing very well um, most of the dimensions people were saying we're only doing okay right so we're in the middle so so this is data from from the CDA but but it points to that there is this real need to focus on this whole issue of sustainable tourism so I think the the, the work of the committee going forward and over the last year has been really important to drill into what does a sustainable tourism industry look like in this region um, and without going too sort of far into the methodology, but if you were in the think tank, you remember we talked about these different scenarios for the future. So we played out these different kind of ideas about um, how the, the sort of tourism economy in the region could evolve. Um, and, and essentially that our big arrow is pointing to this sort of concept of called embrace our place. And that was this notion of a preferred future uh, that was developed through the CDA. And, and we, you'll see that language of embrace our place uh, as we go through the discussion today and into the future. Um, the last part of the CDA, and we we sort of ran this out at the community summit and you got your input onto that. You had, had a chance to put up sticky notes and vote and so on. Um, but it was this idea of thinking about what are the big kind of strategic pillars you would need to be, to have in place to be able to create this future called Embrace Our Place. And, you know, regional collaboration, convening communication leadership role, one big kind of piece there, um, creating community engagement and buy-in, um, tourism workforce and housing development, um, taking a green and environmentally responsible uh, role model approach and creating and refining compelling unique visitor experiences. And they were the sort of big uh, pillars that came out of that work. And we're gonna talk about uh, pillars a little bit today, but particularly um, through the next two uh, community Zooms. Um, and then in the report, if you've looked at that, we, we built out the, the actions under those pillars a little bit more. Um, and so that's, and so we've been working on that. But the other part of what I want to talk about today is, so since the CDA, um, I just want to kind of hit on what might be some emerging trends, because obviously COVID's not everybody sideways, right? So uh, what, what are some potential trends that that are worth taking note of as we think about sort of moving forward. And, and the way I've been working on this is I sort of break them down into what trends are being amplified and accelerated by 
by COVID. And I think actually a lot of underlying trends that were already occurring are being um, accelerated and amplified. And we'll talk about the ones relevant to you. Uh, then the other part is thinking about what changes might be elastic or, or more elastic. And what I mean by that is that, you know, under, under stress, everything kind of stretches out, right? So it kind of, you know, we stretch out like new things happen, but what happens when the crisis or the situation stops or changes? So say there's a vaccine, right? Do what things do we snap back to the way they were and what things stay as uh, more enduring changes? Um, and then where are their potential tipping points? So that's sort of part of what um, the sort of the lens we take. Uh, and I just picked out three things here, right? That I think are really worth considering. Um, so tourism blast zones in outdoor recreation destinations, right? So I, I some people don't like this term, but I, it's a term that, that I use because I think it reflects how people at local areas feel about tourism sometimes, right? And, and if you take, uh, recreation destinations particularly, right, they can be quite subject to overuse and you get this feeling of a blast zone occurring at a local level. And in, in some locations, that's like a day trip. And, and I know anecdotally, like in our discussions, there's been a bit of this kind of blast zone effect occurring of domestic tourism, um, even in your region, right? So, um, and I think this is a, this is sort of a, 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 a trend that's really kind of quite a bit unnerving for a lot of destinations that, you know, if you get, if you're close to a big city and you're within that reach, then you get a lot of people coming out, perhaps don't know what they're doing. You know, they're trying to get out of the city environment. They may not have the skill sets and so on, but there certainly is an emergence of uh, blast zones. Um, another trend is at what point, so we we're all working from home, right? So, but what, at what point does work from home become work from anywhere? Right? And, and how does that start to be a potential benefit for a region like yours where you might have great recreation amenities, you're still close enough to be able to get into the, into the kind of the groove of big society if you want to, um, but, but how, how much does this needle move in terms of people starting to relocate? And, and certainly in a lot of places, people, second homeowners, for example, are moving into their second home, right? Why? To get out of the city, right? And they get to enjoy the environment, recreate, um, and they can still function uh, their business or whatever they're doing. Um, and then the last one, I think, which is the kind of bigger unknown, right? And, and I think this will be the topic for some really interesting conversations over the next uh, 12 months in, in your region, which is how does tourism transform, right? And if you, you know, the pandemic has no doubt changed a lot of things, right? And people who are being subject to over-tourism are sigh, having a sigh of relief. Airlines are panicking because there's nobody on the planes. <laughs> but there's a lot of people all around the world talking about how does tourism transform? And, and I think there's this sort of sweet spot we have at the moment for you to think about in, in the Mahusik's regions about how do you set the trajectory for tourism? Um, and how, does, how do you continue to transform that? And how does that tie back to the work of the CDA? Um, and when I was looking back through some of the data, right? Um, and this is with some data that was looking at how you, people rated the pillars coming out of the community summit. I'm absolutely convinced that the trends that we're seeing just reinforce the importance of the work that's being done uh, in the region. This, this approach on sustainable tourism, you know, and thinking about getting that balance right between a tourism economy um, and the local community experience, um, being able to figure that out. I, and I actually think I, you know, I've been saying this to, to Mike and Jesse and others is that, that I really think the work that's being done there is really getting to the point of being very much at the cutting edge. And, and I'm absolutely convinced your region has every chance of being not only delivering real value for yourself, right, but actually being a world-class case study of of how a community really gets its hands around tourism and reshapes the tourism industry to be able to build it in a way that gets that balance um, absolutely right. So, Jesse, back to you, but there's just a kind of a, there's a visual recap. So you should recognize some of those images if you haven't, if you haven't been part of it, that should sort of give you a, a sort of warp speed uh, catch up. But also I think the, the key part is that even though we've gone through a massive change with the pandemic, I think it only reinforces the importance of what's being done locally. Yes, and I, uh, I've, I'll reiterate that 
I am so glad we started this process before the pandemic because we would so desperately need to start it now and it would only be harder to start it now. Uh, so thank you very much for that, David. And so next we're going to talk about a few case studies uh, that have um, or that are related to all these topics. So first we will go with Amy Halstead who's going to talk about our Masked Moose program. Thank you, Jesse. Hello, everyone. Great to see so many people here. Um, so having been involved with the CDA from the first day, um, and David mentioned it, cohesion within our community and all kinds of people working together has really enabled the Mass Moose campaign. So to give you a little background, um, the uh, CARE, Federal CARES Act uh, funded states who could then in turn fund municipal COVID awareness campaigns. Um, this came to our attention and, and by that, I mean Loretta Powers, Sarah Hemian at the Filbert Place, Jesse Perkins and me. And so we thought, well, this will be a great idea. And within two days, we developed the Mass Moose concept. And within a week, we submitted our application and we were awarded $130,000 for the town of Bethel for a two and a half month period to deliver a very serious message in what we think, and I think it's been received as a very fun way. So that message is keep, keep healthy, keep open. Because as a community, we've done a great job in following COVID guidelines. So keep healthy, keep open, delivered by an animated character, a social media presence, PR, collateral, and really importantly, so he would be dancing on the side of the street, but also dropping off um, kits full of masks, sanitizer, lanyards, and all kinds of materials to all the businesses in town, in Bethel. Uh, and we did kids kits, including coloring pages for all the children in school, in the Bethel schools, but also we are going to deliver some to schools outside of Bethel we were able to secure additional supplies for Bethel Rescue and other municipal services. Um, and the campaign got extended just slightly. So we are going to, at Jesse's great suggestion, put the campaign on the side of the Mountain Explorer. And we have signs up at the gateway, keep healthy, keep open. And then you see the map, the moose. Part of this um, that's really cool is Dr. Shaw has absolutely embraced the mass moose and we're just waiting for a photo op with him. Um, but we have had PR coverage picked up in LA, San Francisco, uh, Chronicle just did a piece on it at the local and state uh, levels and our analytics from our social media campaigns have indicated that we have a follower from Albania. So that is pretty cool. And then there are a lot of other followers. But, so the point is that keep healthy, keep open is resonated. We had no negative feedback of any kind and it's clear we need it now more than ever. Qu a quick campaign, three months in duration and then we're on to more work on the pillars. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Uh, yeah, I mean, the key thing is that we lay the groundwork to work together and, and with this, Destination Academy process, and that made it so much easier to launch right into something like this when an opportunity struck. So thanks for that overview. Um, so next we're going to move to Mia Purcell, and she's going to she is on the board of the Mahusic Land Trust. She's on the staff of Community Concepts Finance Corporation, and she's going to talk about uh, the land trust's issues with Step Falls this summer and and why why that illustrates why this conversation is so important. So take it away, Mia. All right, thank you, Jesse. Um, although the Mahusik Land Trust has signage at Step Falls, which most of you have probably seen, uh, and it provides guide guidelines for appropriate behavior, uh, the Land Trust basically made a difficult decision to close Step Falls uh, in the month of August because of overcrowding and illegal parking on Route 26. Um, this decision was time consuming it was expensive and it was a public relations challenge for um, both the board of the Mahusik Land Trust and the staff. Um, it involved discussions with the towns, many groups uh, and individuals and the press, as well as a final installation of a, of a fence um, that is around the, the Step Falls area. 
more guidance um, to visitors as well as area residents uh, to prevent misuse and to protect an, our natural tr resource treasures in our area like Step Falls is needed. And the pledge certainly is gonna provide that we hope. Um, the Mahusik Land Trust is in the process of purchasing and conserving other properties in the region, Shelburne River lands. We just uh, have um, completed the campaign for that, which is super exciting. And uh, the Tumble Down Dick is another uh, campaign that we're gonna be starting. These, pre these properties will be open to the public um, and having guidelines to help people enjoy them responsibly is really important. So thank you. Thank you, Mia. Okay. Thanks for that, Mia. And uh, next up, we're going to move to Barbara Barrett, uh, the director of the Maine Mineral and Gem Museum, to talk about our work with a sustainability pledge. Take it away, Barbara. Thanks, Jesse. So we keep throwing around the phrase um, the pledge, but I'm not sure everyone here really understands what the pledge is yet. Um, you know, all of us met uh, back in October last year at the Community Destination Academy, and then we reconvened in January. And then, um, as Mike mentioned, there was this leadership team, and out of that um, was born this thing called the Pledge. And maybe some of you have seen it um, if you travel a lot and go to different areas where you go on a website and you look at where you're going as a destination, and there's information. And a lot of times, um, there's this trend now for people to kind of commit to um, the behaviors that the people of that area hope that the visitors will embrace when they get there, um, hence taking this pledge. And, and so we formed this group back, um, basically in February, we started meeting in the height of, um, you know, well, the beginning of COVID, I guess we're still in the height of it, if we want to really get down to it. Um, and our small group has been taking the information that we um, came to like um, embrace during the CDA and also took some of um, the language from the community heart and soul and took all of that, talked about it a lot and have now been moving towards creating a place for all of this to live. Um, you know, we want to move towards a sustainable um, tourism uh, to have available to people coming to our region. And so, what we've done is um, talked about making a welcome um, a welcomed invite for visitors to come here, but something that also protects the core values of our community and striking, like David said, that balance. And so we literally meet, I don't know, how, how often do we meet? A lot. We've been working on this um, so much and, um, and trying to find a place to put it, you know, we want to have a website. And so one of the things that we've done is um, we created an RFP several months ago and sent it out to about 10 different design firms um, to help us to, like create a logo, to help work on some of the copy and to find it a good place to live that would be access accessible to people coming to the region. And so after going through um, the vetting of different firms, um, we um, kind of did a full circle and landed with uh, Future IQ who, um, you know, David is the director of Future IQ. Kristen is um, on this call right now and she works for Future IQ. And is Mark on the call? I didn't see. But, um, you know, we ended up picking um, Future IQ as a firm to help us move the pledge forward, to give it a place to live and to, you know, get it out into the world. And it's been a really great decision um, as far as all that we're concerned, the people who have been working so intimately with it because this is work that they've done around the country and around the globe with other communities to help them talk to their visitors prior to them coming here. And that's a lot what this is about. Um, and so the pledge will be something that it's a landing site on a, um, on a webpage and it will talk about the core values uh, that we've all um, established through the CDA and um, people will be able to take the pledge. And so, you know, without saying too much more about the language, because I think that part of the idea of inviting the community and having these community Zooms is that we start sharing our findings about what we've done as a pledge group and share that language so that everyone can embrace it as well. Um, right now, um, 
we've landed on the Mahusik way and embrace our place as some of our key phrases and the website's coming together now. It's, I mean, I think it looks great. Um, we've got a great design team. Thank you, Future IQ. And our team um, continues to meet on a weekly basis. So um, that's what the pledge has been doing. And um, it's been a pleasure. And I think that the end result will be something that everybody can really um, feel proud of for our region. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, yes, it's been an incredible process. Yes, and, and meeting weekly, we've really made a ton of progress. Um, next, we're doing so well at sticking to our agenda. Um, so next, just for a couple more minutes, uh, David's gonna fill us in on the next couple in our series of these Lunchbox Zooms. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, so today is a little bit of a fire hose, right? So we know we're just like catching up to speed pretty fast, right? Um, but the next two community Zooms, which, and so what we've tried to do is do these as half hour um, on Wednesdays, you know, on a regular basis, right? So that doesn't take too much time out of your day. You can just plug into it while you're having lunch or whatever. Um, but I wanted to let you know about the next two that are coming up because they're going to be kind of a little different to this one, right? So the one that's on the 2nd of December, so there's two this year, there's 2nd of December and the 9th of December. Um, and we're going to sort of uh, deal with two distinctly different topics on each one. So the first one is going to be about the, the pledge and the outward facing. So if you think of it, there's two sides to this. One is the outward facing to the visitor or the person who's thinking about coming to the region um, and talking about what they can do to, to sort of forward sustainable tourism. The other part is the sort of inward workings of how the community kind of comes together and works on the strategic pillars, right? So. The, the one on the 2nd of December, we're going to preview with you the uh, draft website. And, and it's really designed to, to kind of intersect with somebody who's planning their trip to the region, right? So and it talks to them about, you know, what the sort of behaviours they should be considering, you know, how do we avoid congestion? You know, so we're trying to get ahead of, of the problems that come with sort of, you know, being a tourism destination and get people prepared so that when they come here, they know how to behave, where to go, what to do, what not to do, and so on. But do it in a way that's kind of welcoming and, you know, sort of embraces people. But it's really about introducing people to the values of the region and really um, inviting them to be a partner in being able to build a sustainable tourism destination with the local community, right? So that's, so we want to preview that with you and get your input on that on the second. Then on the ninth, we're going to turn to um, back to the pillars that I talked about as part of the big strategic pillars that are about how to does the community work together in terms of you know leadership, workforce, housing, those type of things, um, and we're going to start to do some more work on prioritising those and then setting up working groups to be able to get into that work um, in 2021. So there'll be a little bit of live polling on the next one. We're going to get your input. Um, we'll you know you'll be able to preview the website and and we wait, but we really want you, we want to include you in this process. That's, so the next ones are gonna be much more seeking your input as opposed to this one's about an update. Okay, back to you, Jesse. Thanks so much, David. Okay, so, wow, we are a minute ahead of our agenda. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, this is a huge fire hose of information. And uh, again, to any of you who are brand new to this process, please feel free to reach out to me or I'm sure any of our speakers today would be happy to answer questions offline. But um, anyway, being respectful of time, if, you, if you've got to go, you've got to go, but we're happy to stick around for another 15 minutes or so and, and just take some questions or put them in the chat, shout them out and, or, or whatever, let's, let's get the ball rolling. Anybody got anything? Unmute yourself. Just to clarify, Mia, so so people don't feel obligated, it's okay to go now. Yes. <laughs> just, just. If you really only have a half an hour and your Zoom fatigue is off the charts, that's <laughs> we totally get it. <laughs> but if you have questions, great. See, everyone thinks someone else has a question and they want to be in on that question. And and if I actually, I'll use the time while people are gathering their thoughts, if I can, Jesse, is I, I wanted to introduce Kristen because um, I forgot to do that. And you did mention it. So Kristen Dahl, if you could wave, you're, where Kristen is on your screen, right? 
Um, so Kristen's working with Future IQ and working with the, the committee, obviously, in developing the, the pledge and so on. A little bit of background. We're just really lucky to have Kristen in on this project. Until about a month ago, Kristen was the Vice President of Destination Development with Travel Oregon um, and really spent over a decade there to develop, building their whole destination development program um, and has just a, a wealth of experience in being able to work with uh, smaller communities in terms of thinking about how to build sustainable tourism and so on, right? But I just want to make sure, Kristen, that people uh, were able to, to see who you were and because uh, you'll be taking a more prominent role, obviously, in the, the coming ones. But Kristen's also been doing a series of interviews locally as well. So I just wanted to point her out, call her out. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's been awesome meeting everyone so far. Kristen has done an amazing job of getting caught up to all this work very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are an amazing amount of similarities. I hate to say it, but you know, it's pretty cool. Yeah, seeing a window into your world over there. I have a question. Actually, I have a, a thought. Kristen, if you could share with us a little bit, you've been doing some uh, kind of one-on-ones or one-on-two type interviews to get even more background. Can you just give us a little overview of, of those conversations and what you're finding? Sure, yeah. And um, ultimately, so far, there haven't been uh, a high volume of them, but I've had a chance to speak with Gabe at Mahusik's Pathways, um, Kirk with the Mahusik Land Trust, and Bonnie Pooley, um, who's here on the call today, as well as Amy. And there's a few more lined up. But um, uh, I would just say what I'm hearing in the conversations is uh, a lot of thoughtfulness and a lot of thinking about um, not only what we might want to put in and communicate through a pledge, that's obviously, that's just a communication tool, but then how do we sort of think about that piece as part of the, the ecosystem and what do we need to do on site and what are the opportunities for experience development you know, around that or to complement that to guide these behaviors and um, guide people to really adopt the values of the local place. So I know that's kind of high level, but it's really what David was talking about is finding that balance, but you know, it, it will need to go beyond the pledge. The pledge is just one tool in the toolbox. Um, and now it's about how once you've explained to people your values, how do you get them to change things? So it's just very tangible things, thinking through with Kirk and um, Gabe in terms of like, how do you change behavior of people on site? You know, are there ways to increase the type of information for people's trip planning around where to find, you know, restrooms, which places are allowed dogs and do not allow dogs? You know, where can we even think about building infrastructure to alleviate some of these issues that are occurring? You know, and, and really deep thinking around, are we giving people the right options and information to help guide their experience? So they're not doing the, you know, they don't have the bad behaviors that you really want to change um, in terms of, you know, illegal parking and maybe, uh, you know, waste removal issues and things like that. Um, and then on the food side, you know, what's I think really striking to me is just how rich it seems that the region is with this reemergence of the local food system. And it feels in some ways nascent. I mean, you may have been doing it for a while. It feels like a reemergence um, and uh, an opportunity to really capitalize that and think about how you build that even further into the experience for people that are newcomers or um, coming in from outside the area. So to me, that, that just, it seemed like there was a lot of opportunity for further conversation. Um, but with, with the recognition that Bonnie really shared and I think zeroed in on very quickly, it's just that so many people who are farming or growing foods or producing things, you know, they have such limited time and limited bandwidth how to help them think about, um, you know, what experiences they might want to provide or maybe partnering with other organizations that could help provide those experiences. So anyway, I'll stop talking. Those were some, some insights that I've gleaned and we'll share back as well with your team. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Jesse, I wanted to just add one thing too for, for people's benefit who perhaps haven't been sort of deeply involved in the process over the last sort of eight months is that I think there's a couple of things that are real standouts that I just wanted to call out, right? So one is uh, the town managers and their involvement, right? We've had really solid participation and regular participation from 
from the town uh, management. And I think that's, you know, and if you look at the pillars, one of them is about, you know, convening local leadership and, and building the collaboration. So I think that's a real plus. Um, and the other one I want to call out too is that Carolyn from Sunday River has been really uh, heavily involved and just been a fantastic contributor. And I know she's not on the, on the link today, but um, but I think building that connection between those major tourism draws and destinations and the, and the sustainable tourism thinking, I think they're really important um, pieces. So it's just, I mean, I, my point of saying that is that you've got really a lot of the key players at the table working together in a really powerful way uh, to, to forward the thinking and the actions. And I think that'll really pay off when we get into the pillars work um, on the 9th of December. I totally agree. And and um, just another thing that maybe not everybody on this call is aware of is in the just before pre COVID, uh, we did have uh, an amazing meeting facilitated by Amy Scott of the not just the town managers, but uh, members of the local select boards. And so really engaging the municipalities in this process has been huge. That's something that we need to revisit that, may, um, I, you know, Bless all of you who are involved in town uh, leadership over the past few months. It's been so, so challenging, but that's that's definitely something we can build upon. Um, and just going back a couple steps to something Kristen said, it I think it's really important. This is this is this it's really important to not frame this whole process as just another marketing campaign by the chamber. Yeah, it's been led by the chamber, but that's really not about like let's get as many bodies here as possible. It's really more about the interaction between tourism and the locals. Uh, what do locals really want to see? How to manage the impact? I really like the phrase that David used. What did you say? A, a bomb zone? <laughs> Ground zero? What was the phrase? <laughs> a blast zone. Blast zone. There we go. Um, you know, we, we it, the locals in their minds can picture exactly what you mean by that. And uh, so it's, it's, but it's such a huge effort of working together to sort of disperse that impact, to educate people before they get here and to, but it's, it's also kind of, I, I really don't like the idea of just like putting up a lot of no signs without giving people alternatives. Like just, just putting up a huge sign that says, no, you can't come here that people don't even see until they get whatever to the blast zone is. They didn't know that place was a blast zone. They don't really know the alternatives unless we help them ahead of time, right? And we have we can do that if we build the right tools. So I think that's a that's a big part of being, uh, you know, showing hospitality and saying, well, this might not be the right place for you, but did you know about all these other places? And um, we have so many organizations working on developing new assets that I think we can we can do this if we put our minds to it from the very beginning. And I think that goes back to, to what Mia said about the land trust too and the, the new things that they're working on. You know, and, and Jesse, if I can just to, to connect to that too, is that, that I think one of the things we want to be thinking about is that, you know, that the traveler who emerges out of the pandemic, at least for a period, there might be a different kind of empathy with travelers. You know, travelers typically have been consumers, you know, that, that you know, people go to and use a place or, you know, recreate. Um, but, but there may be a potential that there's a, like a greater level of consciousness of, you know, as people go out into and people start to re-engage with, with each other. And I think that's a, that's a kind of a sweet spot that this, the pledge and the role out of that is could just really intervene really nicely in that, in that place and build a relationship with people who are either first time or regular visitors that is that has to make them feel like they're really part of the solution, right? So I really love what you said about you know we don't want a bunch of no signs, right? Um, but actually, imagine not just informing. Imagine if they can become part of the solution. You know, they can start to be part of the contributors to defining that sweet spot of the balance, but also sustaining the the ecosystems and the communities and things like that. So I think there's a lot of there's a there's a really fertile moment here, and that's that's kind of what I was pointing to about how will tourism transform. I think there's a chance here to really profoundly transform your tourism and the experience that the, the tourist has with you. Um, can I jump in just for a second? This is this is a little bit of deja vu for me right now. About uh, close to a decade ago, a group was brought together um, and I think the Land Trust was a part of organizing this, but Peter Forbes, you may recognize his name, brought together a group in Bethel Half of them, half of us were the producers, the farmers, the woods workers, et cetera. The other half were the consumers. 
And we worked together for four or five sessions. And it was a very, I thought, wonderful experience for all of us. Um, and the outcome of that was to be a brochure on paper um, that Amy Chapman and a couple others and I were working on writing. And it was very similar to what you're talking about and your pledge. Um, we never brought it to fruition. We began to have doubts about its effectiveness. And I think this pledge makes a great deal of sense, but I would love to share the how far we got because it's all about don't just say no, don't just say no. Um, it was listening to the producers in particular and saying, what do you want people to know when they come here? So I'd love to know uh, who I should share that with. I can jump in, Bonnie. Um, we did actually share that with um, this group, share the draft of that um, brochure with this group and did talk about some of that process. So um, it did make it, it did make it in to this process. The actual brochure or just the notes? Uh, no, the mock-up with, um, and, and the notes that came with oh, that. Um, okay, great. So yeah, that we were able to bring that in. Great. Well, and it, thank you for bringing it up. Too. Yeah, well, it's really yeah. wonderful for me to hear that this is kind of the next iteration and it's going to go much further and I think be very effective. Certainly groundwork. Did I see Kristen waving your hand up there? Did, have you seen that? <laughs> not seen that. I realized like, I'm sure there were many inputs that kind of went into the content that I saw and reviewed. So I imagine it's there, like you said, Amy, but if there was a, um, an original source for that, I wouldn't mind seeing that again, just as we kind of fine tune, be, be nice to look at that. Yeah, and just to, I think, to continue that theme, I, thanks for raising that, Bonnie. I think there we have been looking at the stuff that came out of the work with Peter Forbes. We've also been looking at the stuff that came through the heart and soul process. Um, and in this case, I think we, it really is in a place where we're able to resource it in a way there's been some effective fundraising by the, by the group. That There's going to be something that's going to come out. It's going to be public about or around around this work so it's kind of nice sometimes it takes a while to get to these places uh, but as far as I, I can see this is a piece that is definitely going to to come out and it will be a public piece and we'll have a chance for folks to weigh in on it um, before it becomes that that way but again it's nice sometimes it does take a while to get something over the hump and I'm, I'm pretty confident this one's going to get over the hump great thanks Mike well Bonnie and Kat and Amy Scott the work that you all have done prior to this has had an impact and it's been talked about and considered. So um, it was not for nothing. It has <laughs> carried its way through to all of us. And I wanna thank all of you for that because we talk about it and it's a part of this. So your voice has been heard. You're talking about the cart and soul work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thank you for that. Part of it. Um, <laughs> You know, and that's not my voice. Like that, that was the voice Definitely. and input of 1,500-ish people that live in this area and visit this area. So to know that that continues on through, you know, the lens of sustainable tourism, it's helpful and valuable and um, makes me feel like it wasn't just done to sit on a shelf. So that's great. Anyone else out there with some comments? I want to make a comment because I'm one of the people in the pledge group and so we have these small groups and there is another one that's also underway so where if you if you have some time and you want to help great and the the other one that's underway is on house workforce housing and Mia Purcell and Amy Scott are kind of the, the glue that's holding that together um, and then I know I don't want to scoop our own messaging, but we will talk more on December 9th about how do we tackle those other pillars that you saw when David shared um, the outcomes of the CDA. Yes, I'm super excited to get into the meat of revisiting those pillars, coming up with priorities based on what we know now about the world and moving forward. So that will definitely be within the next couple of Zooms. Uh, with that, we are at 1245. So 
that's our allotted time. And again, want to be respectful of your time. So uh, lucky for us, this is not the last time that we'll be meeting and uh, is really just the beginning again. So thank you all so much for giving us this time and I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and hopefully we'll see you again on December 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.